I love how you have a phone that has no case on it. <laughs> it's cracked. Yeah, you have a bunch of fear <laughs> on other things. How many dollars have you made in your life with another human being not involved? One relationship that you'll connect me with will open up a door or a myriad of opportunities that I don't know yet. But it's just something we don't think about. Like yeah. I would never have thought of that. This is why I don't talk about this stuff on YouTube. Hey guys, I'm here with my good friend, Amy Majori. This is actually her video. She's interviewing me for some odd reason. She actually came prepared with some questions. Who knows what they are? But she's been a good friend of mine for about a year and a half. I love her dearly. Wherever this ends up, whether it's YouTube, a podcast, whatever, give her some love down in the comments. Make sure you give her a rating. Tell her how bad she is. She actually traveled here. She spent money. She has Chris Cinematic running the, the dashboard today. There's money being spent on this content. So make sure you give her some love and, and show her some appreciation. What's up, Amy? How are you doing? I'm doing great. Thank you. It's always so good to see you. Yeah. I just want to start with like, obviously so many people know your story, right? Mm -hmm. Like I know your background and how you got started. Yeah. What I would love to understand more of is like, why sub two? Like what got you into sub two financing? I had to. When I was a contractor, I was simultaneously running a wholesale operation doing fix and flip, and I was accumulating rentals through some creative finance, but those were not the best deals I've ever structured. And the reason being is because I had capital, I have money, I had whatever. And I always tell people the best deals you'll ever structure are when you have no money or when you're using somebody else's money. Okay. But when you have an abundance of cash sitting in your bank account, you actually structure really bad deals. So actually this is good because I don't believe in keeping money in the bank. I'm the, op I'm the exact same as you. I'm okay. the opposite of what everybody else tells you. I was a contractor and simultaneously building a rental portfolio. I had one of my biggest clients in my construction business file bankruptcy. Mm -hmm. And I realized in that moment, oh my gosh, I don't control my future. I don't control my world when I'm a contractor working for other people. And I sold all my rentals and I sold my primary residence just to get out of this bad situation this guy put me in. And I found myself in 2018, basically having to start all over from scratch with the skill and understanding of creative finance. And I was like, all right, I have nothing. I have to rebuild. If I have nothing, then what should I do? And I'm like, oh, creative finance, sub two and seller finance. I've been doing it for a couple of years. Let me just focus on that. Mm -hmm. And within like 18 months, I was known as the creative finance right. guy. And he, what's crazy, I was talking about this last night with one of my attorneys. He says, do you realize that that moment in 2018, you shaped an entire industry? Yeah. Because I, the way title companies now do seller finance subject to innovation agreements, lease options, is all based on the way that I did them. And I bashed my head against walls working with title companies as I spread across the country. And now my process, my paperwork, my flow, the ideas, the terminology, the vernacular, the processes, even the, the after you buy the property, like how you onboard it into your portfolio, literally all of that was created by me back in 2018, 19 and 20 out of necessity and out of the fact that I didn't have any money. But that's insane. That was literally just three to five years ago. Yeah. Like, yeah. That's ridiculous. I'm still creating new strategies. Like I created this, the Gator strategy a year ago and now yeah. I have like 7,000 students in the Gator Which strategy. Which is amazing. Yeah. And it's like, even that, like, it's easy for me to sit here and say, that's such a simple strategy, but it's just something we don't think about. Like, yeah. I would never have thought of that. And I'm like, it's something that we all need to leverage and implement as real estate investors, like regardless of what our investment strategy is. Yeah. Okay. So I do want to know though, and this wasn't on my list of questions. They never are. Um, when you hang out with me, we come up with, <laughs> I'm like, why, why even come prepared when you come to well, talk I'm to like, Pace? I have to be respectful of his time. No, you, so. I'm, I'm chilling. What do you do? Like, if you don't keep money in the bank and neither do I. What do you do with your money? Okay, so I do a lot of things with my money. For a long time, I only used other people's money to buy real estate. Okay. And when I got to a point where my cash flow was significant enough, I could then pay my private money lenders back. This started in like 2020. My cash flow, I would go raise a bunch of money for through 2019, buy a bunch of deals. And then in 2020, I would pay back all the people I raised from 2019 okay. from my cash flow. So I wasn't taking my cash flow to live on. And I was just paying back my private money lenders, taking them off my deals and then putting them on the next batch of deals and then so on and so forth. I'd say 2022 was the last year I really needed to raise private capital. And that's because now my cash flow is so significant on my personal deals that I no longer need to go raise money for my personal deals. Right. So you just, my portfolio is basically self-sufficient and right. it, it brings in a couple hundred thousand dollars a month in cash flow. I use that couple hundred thousand dollars to buy the next set of deals where I use other people's money is now in significant 
significantly larger deals like multifamily and stuff like that. What I do with my money mm-hmm. is I buy businesses. Okay. We own like title and escrow, lending oh, business. Yeah, that's we right. we okay. own a lot of things. So, okay. And I say we because it's not just me. Right. What a lot of people don't see on social media is that I have an office full of a lot of people and amazing team members, but I'm allergic to going to office. So they don't, nobody gets to see my team. So a couple of months ago, I had somebody come to me on a Houston portfolio, not a portfolio, just one big asset. It was 580 units in Houston. And they said, we need help. We need $2 million to buy out some bad partners that aren't operating properly. And I go, hmm, this is a unique opportunity. If I put $2 million into this deal, it's a $109 million asset. I could basically capture 20% ownership of a $109 million asset for only 2% of the asset price. That's insane. Right, Just cre- I'm just creatively doing things all the time, right? So I go, when do you need the money by? And they go, well, we need it in 10 days. I go, I don't have 2 million bucks right now because again, my money's always gone. So what do I do? I go to a bunch of private money lenders and I go, hey guys, I need $2 million. I'll pay you 10% simple interest, 10% every, not every month, but per annum. Right. And so they're receiving a check every month and I tell them I need your money for six months. Why? Because I go, oh, well, here's what I'll do. I'll take my money from this, 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 and this. And every month I'll pay down my private money lenders 500 grand. So like just yesterday, I deployed $725,000 of my private, of my own money to pay down that $2 million debt that I have right. on that ha- asset. So now I still owe $1.3 million to those private money lenders. And I'll probably pay that off in the next two months. You're at a whole different level, like personally, professionally, your finances don't look like yeah, all the finances, I don't, right? This is why I don't talk about this stuff on YouTube because a lot of people are like, oh my gosh, $700,000. I usually just talk about my single family stuff because it makes sense to people. They understand it. But there's no reason why myself included and everyone watching or whatever we're doing can't do what you just did because raising $2 million in private money, like that's not hard. No. A brand new real estate investor can do that. Easy. Now, I'm not saying go buy a hundred million dollar, whatever yes, asset family if you're brand new, but people look at, oh, I can't go buy a single family home or I can't invest in multifamily because I don't have my own money. You don't need your own money. Like, I don't learn- use any of my own money to do any of my, I don't use credit. I have not pulled my credit in like eight years. Yeah. Even the house that we're in right now, big 12,000 square foot house. I did not pull my credit for this. I took it over on sub two and seller finance. I have not the same thing with cars, same thing with businesses. Every business I buy is with creative finance too. Okay. So let's talk about how you're able to develop and cultivate these relationships because whether it's putting together a sub two deal or buying a company or leading a team, what does networking mean to you? First of all, I wrote a book on networking and nobody would ever know because I never talk about it. Mm. So I do want to talk about networking. What does it mean to you and how do you integrate it into your day-to-day lifestyle? Think about like the power you have in your phone, even though you have no phone case on your phone. (laughs) Think about the power you have in your phone, Okay. right? You need something, chances are at your level, you have those Mm -hmm. resources in your phone. Same thing with me. Think about having access to my phone. What could that do for you? If I go, hey, here's everything in my phone and I'll let you text anybody in my phone. Dean Graziosi, Tony Robbins, uh, uh, who do you want to text? Right. Matthew McConaughey, you want to text Big Boy from Outcast? Who do you want to text? Text anybody you want that's in my phone and text them and go, hey, Big Boy from Outcast, you should know Amy Majori. She's unbelievable. Let me connect you. If you could do that, with my phone all day long, how much money, how much influence, how much resources and influence could you essentially gather? A lot. Right. So every time I meet a new person, all there's, I'm thinking is what's in your phone? What relationships do you have? What access do you have? Who did you go to high school with? Cause everybody's like, oh, I went to high school with this person that's right. famous, or I went to high school with the guy that started I storage that exited for $400 billion. I went out. So, okay. Everybody has one of those relationships. Even if you're a poor podunk person in Missouri that ha- you have two teeth, I can tell to guarantee you, you have more friends of influence than you have teeth. So I agree with you. And, but here's something that I think you and I both see, whether it's in person or on social media all the time or at events mm-hmm. is people will be like, Pace just told me to think about how I can get into like Amy's phone or Pace's phone and yeah. hey, can I pay you to tap into your phone? No, it goes no, back to like, no, no. how can, like, I'm here with you because I have established a relationship, a relationship with you, right? Yeah. And it's all about like value and yeah. how can I help you? And you say this all the time, like, how can I help you? All the time. Right. And because when you think about genuinely helping other people, the law of reciprocity is going to find its way back to you. Yeah. I'll give a good example. Like when I first became friends with you, it's this is how I treat every relationship, whether people want it or not, you are one of, 25 people in a group thread that I met and I reached out and I was like, Hey, does anybody want me to help them with their clever summit launch? I'll use your code and promote you. 
to my audience. Right. So I leveraged my audience, which I created, cultivated for years and years. And I was like, I will push your code, which I did. I don't right. know. How, I don't know how much money you made, but you got accolades and Sperber's like, oh my gosh, Amy's crushing it. She's doing great. And he great. was like, I was wondering what happened or what you did. I was like, that wasn't me. All right. But, but that's, yeah. that's creating value. I didn't ask, hey, how quick can I create value for you? I just knew the context of where you and I met Right. was under the context of Sperber trying to get us to promote Clever Summit. Right. I obviously can promote things really well. And so I'm like, I don't need to promote anymore. How does this benefit me to just be the person that wins everything? Right. So I went to you and I went to Vina. I said, who wants to collaborate with me? And you actually like, I would love right. to collaborate. And that's I how like we start our relationship. immediately sent you a message. So. Yeah, so you sent me a message. We did a live. I promoted your thing. Shortly thereafter, I go, what else do you have going on? You told me I have a private money thing going on in LA and I'm, you know, I'm kind of newer to doing events. I go, great. I'll buy out your whole event. I was just talking to Chris about that yesterday. I think I spent 10 grand or something. I don't know. Yeah. What and at the time, and this was only a year and a half ago or so. Yeah. At the time I was like, don't think I realized what was happening. I was trying to be your friend. Somebody from your team called me to like, give me your credit card info. I was like, no, like, yeah. I don't want you to do that. But well, I also think, think about the filter, right? There has to be a filter in every relationship because everybody wants to get your attention or my attention or whatever. I have a thousand people that say, I want to do something with you. Pace, we speak on my podcast. Pace, we do this with me. I'm like, okay, well, what filter have you gone through that I know you're not a weirdo? Yeah. So I, I, I'm sure. assuming it's the same thing on the other side is that probably five years ago, I stopped looking at money as money. I started looking as, at money as a tool. So I look at this, I go, here's a tool to show Amy that I'm serious about being her friend and that every step I walk with her on her journey, I'm going to be there to encourage her to be successful and I'll shout her names from the rooftops and I'll champion her. And that is creating value. Have I needed anything in your network yet? No. No. And of course but I'm always like, say, how can I help you? But, but one day, five years down the road, 10 years down the road, you never know. And this is the problem with networking. People are so fudging short-sighted right. that they go, well, I haven't gotten any value out of this person. I'm like, it takes time. First and foremost, yeah. you are getting value from this person because the way they operate, right? You should be going and networking with people of value, meaning they have their crap together. Right. They, they're respectful. They, they're not cheating on their spouse. They've right. got, they, they, they might be parents. They might have tips and tricks on how to be a better parent. It's not all about money, everybody. Right. It's not always about money. So have I gotten value from you? Yes. I want to hang out with other high level operators. I want to hang out with other people that are in that thread of, I want to do more. Right. Because what happens when you hang out with, with uh, donkeys, you become a donkey. What happens when you hang out with thoroughbreds, you become a thoroughbred. <laughs> right. So the value you provide to me is I get to be in your presence. Now, will there be additional value in the future? The answer is yes, of sure. course there will be. Right. As of right now, I might have a little bit more to offer you in the current, not that I have more in general, but what you have going on in your life right. and the phase you're in and the phase I'm in, I might have a couple of objects on my shelf that I'm like, oh, hey, these spices would be really good for the recipe you're cooking up right now. Right. And at some point I might go, hey, I'm cooking up a recipe over here and I got to go look at your shelf and go, hey, do you have some sugar and you have some brown sugar and you have some this and that and whatever. Right. And you'll go, yeah, I do have those. I assume that when I, sh I show up one day, I go, hey, Amy, can you help me out with this? Or I saw you hanging out with this person. I need to, need to be connected with them. One relationship that you'll connect me with will open up a, a door or a myriad of opportunities that I don't know yet. A hundred percent. But I know you are a person of value. Therefore, if I'm connected to you, then I know at some point we can leverage each other. Yes. I In agree. fact, I don't want a friend that can't leverage me. I think that, yeah. but I'm so worried about like offending someone. But it's like, no, unless you add value, whatever value means to me, like, and I can provide value as well. Like, I don't have time for that. Offending somebody is also another filter, right? So think about this. <laughs> right. It's another filter. I want to offend you because if I offend you, that means you stop watching my show. Yeah. And you go somewhere else. I want my vibe to attract my tribe. Right. I want go givers. I want people of abundance. And if I offend you by saying, I don't want to have friends I can't leverage. Right. Then you're not meant to be in my network. Then you, yeah. you need to go away. I agree. I'm so glad it offended you. Right. Right. And so I don't want weirdos that are like, oh, well, you should love everybody. I do love everybody. I wake up in the morning. I'm not making decisions for myself. Who am I making decisions for? I'm making decisions maybe for Sean, your daughter, et cetera. For me, I'm making decisions for Laura, my kids. Right. I'm making decisions for my partners. I have nine business partners. I have multiple operators underneath them and I have 700 employees. I'm making a decision, not just for those 700 employees, but also their wife and their kids. When I make a decision to waste my time with somebody I can't leverage and they can't leverage me, I didn't just waste my time. 
I wasted 700 other people's families' time right. because I am a conduit to make sure that these companies are successful. It's a higher level of thinking. It is. I'm really not that cool of a guy. Well, I don't look at it that way, though. I do. I mean, leverage me uh -oh. or stay away from me. That's all I have to say. We also have to align in personality and morale, right? And yeah, yeah, there's other filters, right? Yes. Um, there's other filters. There's people that like even are in our circle that right. are like, your energy is not my energy. It doesn't mean you're a bad person, but your energy is not mine. I don't want to be around you because I get sucked into this energy that you're, you're maybe not even a negative person, but like we have a friend in our circle group. You won't even think of who this person is that literally every time I'm around them, they're promoting something all the time. Like they can't just have a regular conversation. It's like, Hey, I got this thing going on. I'm like, bro, can we just talk about something yes. other than your promotion? <sighs> That's what, like, this is not how you add value and network with people. Correct. So like the energy is off a little bit. I'm like, I just feel like every time we talk, it's kind of like with my dad. Okay. So like my dad, anytime he comes to my house, he's like, Hey, let me hang out with you. I want to see your kids. No, you don't. You want to ask me for money. Oh, that's okay. sad. There's so many people have that in their lives, right? My, I love my dad. He taught me a work ethic, but my dad comes over and I'm like, okay, I love you, but the energy's off and you take away from what I should be working on. Right. So the answer is here, I'm gonna gift you the money. It's not a loan, here's a gift, please go away from me. So that kind of stuff happens all the time. So like, look, let's hear, let me give you another specific example. I look at, in the influence game, who's the number one, who's the number one person? Tony Robbins, like nobody's bigger than Tony Robbins. Right. Nobody's more influential, nobody's been doing it longer. So I go, how, how do I develop a true meaningful relationship with Tony Robbins? And I look around his circle and I go, oh, Dean Graziosi. Dean Graziosi lives here local. Cody Sperber knows Dean Graziosi. Okay, I'm going to serve Cody. I'm going to do something massive for Cody over and over and over and over and over right. to the point where Cody's like, why are you always doing this stuff for me? And I go, I'd like you to introduce me to Dean Graziosi. And then I immediately go to Dean Graziosi for two years. I promoted his launch. He has yes. this big launch. I won it two years in a row. Yeah. I just, I found out last night at midnight, I won his launch. And he's just like, you blew it by everybody. He's like, you didn't have to do this. And I go, yeah, I did because I want to ultimately build a relationship with you. Right. That is a foundation of me bringing about something of value to you rather than me asking for something first. And I love that. And again, it's like, we're the same person. Yeah. But I also would love for you to clarify that it's not like you were trying to help and serve Cody just to get to Dean. You really like Cody. I you love know, Cody. like you really love him. You, re you guys collab together genuinely. I didn't even necessarily know that Dean was my ask. I knew always, Cody's always done things for me and I appreciate Cody, we've collaborated. Right. And I just went to him, I go, you are somebody of value. You've bring, brought value to me. Right. How do I serve you, serve you, serve you, serve you, serve you? So that at some point when I have some very clear objective, right. I can go, oh my gosh, can you please connect me? You know what happened with Cody, actually? I didn't ask Cody to introduce me to Dean Graziosi. Cody did it on his own yeah. behalf because he's like, dude, you have overwhelmed me with whatever. I'm going to introduce you to, to Dean. I've been friends with Ryan Pineda for like six years. Mm -hmm. We, we can't, kind of came up in the game together. Like we were stupid little idiots together, you know? <laughs> And Ryan and I were hanging out for a long time and he had a relationship with Cody Sanchez. And I was like, I want a relationship with Cody. I had already provided so much value for Ryan. I had right. promoted his events. I had done all sorts of things for his community. I'll do meetups with them. I'll, I'll promote whatever Ryan's got going on. Ryan comes out with this tykes thing and I go, I'll drop 50 grand on whatever you got going on. And his team goes, Hey, you've just bought the tykes NFTs. Where can we send your NFTs? Please give us your wallet. I was like, what did I buy? Oh, I have no know. idea what I bought. I don't care. Right. What I do is if my friends are got something going on, I'm going to support them with love and just go, here I am supporting you. Right. And one day I didn't have to wait for Ryan. I just went to Ryan and go, Hey, can you introduce me to Cody? He goes, yes. Yeah. It was already like set in stone. There are times where I now can ask specifically for what I want. I then go, Hey, I want to collaborate with you on buying businesses. And I find out some things that she needs in hers. And I bring those to her, bring right. those to her, bring those to her. Then she sends me a text message like three months ago. And she goes, when I first met you, I thought you were too good to be true. You're so foolish. I thought nobody could be this nice. Nobody could care this much about helping right. other people. And she's just like, all I want to do is just hang out with you now. Right. And then at this point, I already had a relationship with Dean Graziosi. And Dean goes, hey, I need somebody that does X, Y, and Z. I go, no problem. Let me introduce you to Cody. Right. But then what I also do as I go above and beyond, I go back to Ryan. I go, Ryan, I just want to let you know that the relationship you gave me with Cody, I'm so grateful for it. I took that relationship and I gave it to Dean. Is there any way you and Dean should know each other? Because I could put you in touch with Dean as well. And he's like, what? Nobody ever tells me where my relationships go. Thank you so much. So it's like, 
I believe in networking so much yeah. and it's probably 40% of what I do on, on a It's so daily powerful. Basis. Um, we were chatting with someone yesterday who said to me, currency isn't money. Currency is relationships. All day. And I'm like, God, that was such a great way. Like yeah. it was such a good al analogy. I had, here's, for, here's another weird one. Okay. Forget about influence, right? Because a lot of people are like, okay, Dean Graziosi and Tony Robbins and Ryan Pineda and Cody Sanchez. Like, oh, those, what do I use those names for? Okay. How about this? Here's a different way of thinking about everything. So I had a student, um, I give a proof of funds to all my students and my proof of funds is like super gangster. Okay. My proof of funds is me in a video. Hey, like, let's say that I'm a student of mine. Mm -hmm. Okay. My name's Tim. I go to a real estate agent and I submit an offer on a deal and the real estate agent says, no problem. Send me a proof of funds. My students actually get a video of me logging into my bank account live on a screen share. And I go, Hey, um, whoever is watching this video in the future, my name is Pace. I'm partnering with whoever sent this, this to you. I've got multiple partners all over the country. Here's who I am. Here's my credibility. Here's my websites. Here's my A&E TV show, my YouTube channel. Here's my assets. Here's my real estate schedule owned. And let me log into my chase account. Here's my real login. I actually type in my login and my password password and I pull up 40 bank accounts and I show them like 3 million or 4 million bucks, right? Mm -hmm. My students get to take that video and they send it out to real estate agents. It's almost so good. It's amazing. It actually causes problems. I didn't know you did that. Oh, I do. That's like 1% of 1% of what I do. My students then get all these deals because they're like, holy crap, like what's better than a proof of funds is somebody actually logging into their bank account right. and talking to the person that's being sent the proof of funds. Well, this agent two days ago, received this from one of my students, Tim. The agent's like, there's no way this is real. You, this guy's, <laughs> you're, you're scamming me. This is like too good, too polished, you're scamming me. So she sends it to the Attorney General of California. The Attorney General of California calls Molly, my head of ops, mm -hmm. and is like, what kind of scam operation are you guys running, blah, 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 blah. Molly's like, you need to call the Attorney General of California. This is a significant problem. By the end of the phone call with the attorney general, I've got him to agree to come in and do a, a real estate event talking about fraud in real estate and this and that and the other. And here's what I do. I go to Vina, Jerry Norton, Jamil Damji, Brent Daniels, Ryan Pineda, like all these people in my real estate corner. And I go, I have the attorney general of California agreeing to do a two hour live with us talking to the entire real estate industry about how to avoid fraud and what's going on in title scams and EMD scams and fake sellers and fake buyers and fake this, that, and the other, blah, 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 blah. Let's go out to our collective communities and do something really cool. And everybody in the group chat is like, here you go again, always finding right. ways to provide value. <laughs> so I took something of somebody that has influence, but not from like a social media standpoint. Right. And I turned the relationship into something positive that I, I could then go and give to my friends. That is so powerful. It's not just about doing promotions for people. It's right. every single minute of every single day I'm right. trying to provide value to somebody else. And it's a lot of it's like just leveraging off the resources around you and looking yeah. at your network. And it's not like you have to sit here and time block to network. It's just like how are you a good person every day? And think about, well, think of, back. It's, there's all, a lot of worthiness questions as well. So like most people, when you first got involved in business and somebody told you like, okay, hire an attorney, you're like, hire an attorney. Oh my gosh. I don't want to hire an attorney. That's so scary. I'm like, dude, I go to dinner with attorneys now, yeah. hang out with attorneys. It becomes a common part of your business. But in the very beginning, even when I first talked to my first appraiser and my first broker and my first licensed blah, blah, blah. Anybody that's a doctor, we're like taught to revere them yeah, and fear them. So when I talked to the attorney general, most other people would have looked at and go, yes, sir, everything's real. Um, eh, and they have fear in their voice. There's a lot to learn. These micro talents and these micro skills, I wasn't born with them. I didn't come out of my mom's womb right. and the doctor handed me a basket of skills. And one of the skills in that basket was how to talk to an attorney general. Right. I had to cultivate this and get over some fear and also understand that I am worthy of every relationship that I want. Yeah. As long as I come with with it away from it saying friend. So at the end of the phone call, the attorney general says, man, I just want to say, just say, thank you so much for your time, brother. <laughs> he says brother to me. I can get so in deep with people's relationship because I care so much right? that by the end of a 15 minute phone call, the attorney general is like, thank you, brother. Right. Rather than like, thank you, sir. It's just like, just be a normal person. Yeah. I tell people all day long, I can give you a hundred scripts, but why just be a normal person? Yeah. Did you, when Sean and you went on a date, your first date, did he have a script written on his hand? <laughs> I thought our first date was a business meeting. Oh, really? Yeah. But he, no. Why? Because he said, let's get down to business. <laughs> it's actually, this is a good story. <laughs> uh, no. So we ran in the same circle and we were both actually students or he was working and I was a student at a real estate educational company and I was living in Chicago. He was living in San Diego. He flew into town and was like, 
it was a day game at Wrigley. He's like, Hey, I got an extra ticket. You want to go? And I was like, yeah, sure. To me, I'm like, this is good networking, mm. right? Because like he's one touch away from someone. Um, and how can I help him? Of course. So we went to the Cubs game and in the middle of the seventh inning stretch, he came in for a kiss. Oh, hell yeah. And no, That's and I guy. did, I did this. You did that? I did. Yeah. And I go, I'm sorry. I thought this was a meeting. And his response was something along the lines of so cheesy. I love you, honey. It was your cheek better get used to like turning away or get used to it. Basically, I'm not going to stop. So then it just got awkward. And so I just kept drinking. And then by midnight, I was, <laughs> by midnight, I went home. But if Sean was here, he would tell you, which is true. Then I tried to kiss him and he was like, who do you think I am? And then the rest is history. I love it. I moved in with him three months later. My dad's dead. So I can say this now. Dad didn't it. know. So. I love that. Talk about creating value with each other. It's freaking gangster. <laughs> um, <laughs> okay. So let's shift gears a little bit because I know that there are so many questions that we both get and people who are wondering, like, I'm not going to invest in real estate right now. Now is not the time. It doesn't matter if there's an economic recession or downturn. There's always a good time to invest in real estate. Would you agree? I don't think there's ever been a bad time. To okay, great. I, got a little, I, I was like, what are you going to say? So you can make an argument that back in 2008, market's at its height, that if I bought $20 million in real estate and I accumulated all this debt, where would it be now oh, in 15 like, years? Would it be good worth debt, more or less? More. Yeah, good debt. Yeah, good, right. So good debt versus bad debt, which right. I never talk enough about. But Yeah. So I let's say that I accumulated rentals that were all cash flowing rentals. So 15 years later, you know, you see these people back in 2009, 2010, they're bailing on all their rental properties. I'm like, why are you bailing on these rental properties? Are they cash flowing? Yeah, but they're losing equity. Equity comes, equity goes, Correct. but the cash will always flow. I Correct. always tell people that. Stop with this equity bull crap. Yeah. The things that I look at and like, okay, if it's a cash flowing asset, it will always appreciate over long term. It's kind of like when you marry somebody, everybody you marry is not going to stay the exact same. They're right. always going to get better. Like a good marriage always gets right. better. You and Sean has, it's appreciated for you, right? Right. So I look at other people and I'm like, guys, every relationship that you have, a true relationship is a long game. Like you're constantly working on yourself. They're working right. on themselves. So I look at real estate as I have a relationship with my houses. These relationships, I take care of the properties. I take care of my tenants. These relationships continue to improve and the value of those relationships continue to improve as well. You and I in 10 years, our relationship today is valuable to me, but in 10 years, it'll only be more valuable. Right. So telling me it's not a good time to buy real estate is like telling me it's not a good time to network with people. Networking is a long game. So is real estate. Everything is a lot. Everything of value is a long game. Agreed. And also because I feel like so many people, especially I would say, especially the newer real estate investors, they don't know what to look for necessarily. Yeah. And so they're not buying right. So you guys got to make sure like even during a downturn, like as long as you buy right, it doesn't matter. Like there's so many ways that you, you can make here, money. Here, you want to know how to buy right? Yeah. Go find a deal and partner with somebody that has been doing it for a long time. Yeah. That's it. Find a partner that knows how to do management, knows how to find great contractors. Go partner with somebody. Right. They're going to verify and be that filter for you because there's a big running up period. It's like a big runway before takeoff. And that runway in real estate is like, I got to learn how to comp. I got to learn right. how to comp. I got to um, learn how to comp. I got to right. learn how to comp. That now I know what a good deal looks like. And then I have to screw up three bad deals to learn all the things I thought I knew that I ended up not knowing. Right. Or you could just skip the line and go, I'm going to go find somebody in a real estate community that has been doing 50 deals and I'm just going to attach myself to them for the first five deals that I do. Right. Now I get all that learning curve condensed to me. Cheat code. Boom. Done. And that's an amazing strategy. And I actually did this for my first two deals. I did partner with somebody as I was building my power team, as I was getting better at learning how to raise private money. And when you have a partner like that, and again, there's no right or wrong way, right? It's just like whatever works for you and whatever makes you happy. You can also leverage off of those credentials and those relationships and all the time. This is my partner. So that's your team of experts, right? Like right. when it comes to raising capital or instilling trust in to people that you're working with. So right. don't ever be afraid to partner with somebody. And even I would be afraid not to partner. I don't have anything. I don't. Let me ask you a question. How many dollars have you made in your life with another human being not involved? <sighs> can't understand that question. <laughs> okay. Have you ever made a dollar in your life without another human being involved? Without another? Yes. How? Oh, I understand. <laughs> well, no. Think about it. Because it involves 
okay. It's physically impossible <laughs> right? for you to make a dollar without another human being. So involved. I was thinking just like it's physically impossible. You could think about it. There's always a no. Human. You're Even right. If you start thinking about digital stuff, or somebody c comes to me and goes, "Well, I bought money. I have a vending machine." Okay, so you didn't. You don't have customers, right? You don't have humans yeah. eating the shit out of your vending machine. Oh yeah, I guess so. Okay, so it's physically impossible for you to go out and make money without another human being involved. Okay, so you're right. So though. And I agree with so you. So when people are like, I don't want a partner. Everybody is a partner to you. And everyone's a part of your team. Right. So when people are like, I don't have a team, I can't do this or that. Yes, you can. The person closing escrow is a part of your team. That's correct. Your power team. Right? Yeah, so exactly. So like your attorney, your escrow officer, right. your transaction coordinator, you know, all these people that you outsource to on an individual deal right. is basically a utility player in your business. Yeah. Now you're thinking about how you made money without another human being involved? No, because this is the thing. Like, that's exactly what I preach and teach. <laughs> Yeah. But I just say it in a different way. Yeah. Like when someone's like, I, I can't raise money. I'm like, yeah, you can. You have a team. You have an architect. You have a designer. You have a stager. Like just because they're not on payroll, it doesn't mean you don't have a team. Yeah. But your analogy is, has resonated with me now. It's just another way, right? It's like- Just another way of saying Somebody thing, will yeah. tell me the same thing for five years, but until somebody says it in a way that- Makes sense for you. Right. Yeah. Like I don't- Like an Italian. An Italian. <laughs> I'm just kidding, guys. She's not an Italian. Okay? I'm not Italian. <laughs> But thank you. Okay, I do want to talk a little bit about private money because regardless of the investment strategy, we all need more money. We could all use more money in our businesses. It's not even a matter of opinion. It's a fact. Yeah, like the even me, I, I have mil I make millions of dollars a year and I deploy millions of dollars a year. Here's what happens is people will come to me and they go, is there a point where you don't need private money? The answer is no. You'll never be in a position where you have enough money. Want to know why? Because the more deals you do, the more credibility you build. The more credibility you build, the more people want to bring opportunities to right. you. The more opportunities you have, the more money you need. And it's this never-ending cycle. It's like the second I pay off my private money lenders, some big, amazing deal comes along. I'm like, I got to raise money again. So I'm like, once you learn that, you always have to be in raising capital mode. Mm -hmm. Like I'm always raising money. Agreed. And it's always, I always tell people, no matter how good you have it, it doesn't matter. Even you, we never stop raising money. We never stop looking for general contractors. It's yeah. like, no matter how good you have it. Or I also say investor friendly realtors. That's just me though. Yeah. But when it comes to raising private money, there's always risk involved, right? Mm -hmm. So can you give me an example of how do you mitigate risk or what are things you do when you speak to a private money lenders? Let's go back to before pace was pace, right? And you were like out there and you were raising money. Pace has always been pace. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Before, before you are who you are today, give our listeners some ideas or not even ideas, things that they should be doing to mitigate risk and increase control in their business so that private money lenders see the value in lending them their hard earned dollars. Um, first and foremost, leverage partnerships. Right. Because like one of the best ways to raise money in the very beginning of your journey, let's say you want to raise money in multifamily. A lot of people have, it's like the chicken and the egg conversation. Right. They go, well, I don't have never done a deal before yet. Why would I learn how to raise money? You could go to a Vina Jetty. You could go to a Brandon Turner. You could go to a Pace Morby and say, you have the deals. Right. I don't want to go find the deals. I don't want to negotiate those deals. I want to leverage your team, obviously through a fund to fund structure, right? Or super fund, sometimes people call them. I will just raise money for your deals. So do I have to go out and find my own deals, negotiate? No, I get to leverage all your credibility from day one. And that's easier. It's way so easier. So now the real skill that you, I, I always tell people, I go, people, go, I want to get into multi family I go okay then don't learn multifamily oh my god I have been saying this for I think, three years I go don't learn multifamily because multifamily is two things and you know what it's it, here it's two things and one thing it is not one thing it is not is not real estate multifamily is not real estate you know what it is two things number one it's raising capital it's the number one skill you have to have when you're when you're doing multifamily is raising capital for multifamily the second thing that multifamily is is it's a business right okay i go buy a single family home right now what management do i really have on a single family home right i don't I have a landscaper that comes once a week i have a pool guy that comes once, once a week so easy it's minuscule in the responsibility of the single family home you go to a 50 unit a 200 unit a 500 unit heaven forbid you've got landscapers there every day You've got cleaners there every day. You've got handymen on site. You've got four people in the leasing office. You've got a pool guy there all right. day, every day. You got a maintenance guy going around. You got a security guard. You got, it's a business. Right. It's a full fledged business. It might as well be a freaking restaurant right. with the amount of employees you have. So really the skills you want to learn to get into multifamily is not multifamily. Let Vina Jetty or Pace Morby be your first deal and go, 
I don't also don't want to learn how to run a business. So what does that leave you with? You need to learn how to raise money. And now when you learn how to raise money, you provide value to everybody. If you know how to raise money, I'm always saying you got to raise the money and look for deals at the same time. Now I just say, just go, just for raise the, the money. The yeah. yeah. Like, because it is literally endless opportunity. If you just focus on that one skill set, that's it. You can literally do whatever you want. Yeah. This is, let me tell you my journey of getting into multifamily. So I was doing multifamily for four years on my own, as you know, I, I buy everything taking over payments or seller finance. I didn't need to raise money necessarily. I did like small chunks of money, 40, $50,000 for like closing costs and some minor repairs and maybe switching out a property manager or maybe, you know, getting a lien off the property or whatever. I would lay, raise small amounts of money. Mm -hmm. But one day I woke up and I was like, man, I could do these like 50 to 100 unit apartment complexes, which I still do. Or I could go big league stuff. The problem with big league stuff is now it's a different asset class. It's a different type of conversation, a different demographic. I'm negotiating with brokers, whereas on the smaller multifamily, I'm negotiating with sellers directly. It's a different animal. It's like driving a car versus a motorcycle. Like, yeah, they're both vehicles, but like, they're just different. I go to the big multifamily stuff and I go, you know what I'm going to do? I'm not going to go and work my time and energy on how to find, negotiate, manage, and build a team around big multifamily. I'm just going to find somebody in multifamily that already has those things. Right. And and say, how do I raise money for you? And guess what I learned? I learned how to raise larger sums of money, leveraging somebody else's credibility, somebody else's team, somebody else's story, somebody else's deal. And then what did I let Vina Jetty or Pace Morby then learn the multifamily business by raising money for other people's right. multifamily deals. So people come to me and they go, I want to learn from Vina Jetty. I go, you want to learn from Vina Jetty? Then go raise money for Vina Jetty. Right. Because now you have something of value to bring to her and go, I'm raising money for your deals. Can I watch how this all works? See what your team looks like. See what the in inside workings are. She doesn't want to show you that. I don't have time to show you and this. that's like, not fun. I don't want to learn how to analyze a 250 unit apartment building. No. I have no interest well, in that. But what if you just go, I, I'm really good at building relationships and raising capital for somebody else's stuff. Right. It's the cheat code it's amazing. of real estate. This is the one thing, actually at Cody's event, up until his event, I was in the business for nine years. People would ask me, Amy, what's the one thing you wish you would have done differently? And I'm like, nothing, every win, every loss. It's made me who I am today. Bullshit. It was at his event through people in our group chat yeah. that I actually became their capital partner. I started raising money for them. And I'm like, this is the one thing I wish I would have done differently is just raise money for other people who yeah. have the deal flow. I say this to people all the time. I'm a boy scout. So like, I think of everything as a merit badge, right? Yeah. So like in order to become an Eagle scout, which is like the pinnacle of right. success, <laughs> you have to accumulate all these skills, which are called merit badges. So some of them are like personal finance, archery, canoeing, blah, whatever, right? Shotgun shooting, all these individual skill sets that you have to go out, practice, master, and then pass off. When you pass them off, somebody gives you a merit badge. In real estate, there's also merit badges. Right. And I'm thinking about coming out with a book that's like the merit badges of real estate. And they're all like the micro skills that you have to acquire. Skill number one, raising capital. If I could go back and tell myself to focus on one skill that was the most powerful, like OP, overpowered unbelievable superpower it's raising capital because raising capital everybody wants to hang out with you everybody wants something from you you become the hot chick i don't know what it's like to be the hot chick but i remember trying to get the attention from the hot chick it's sexy it's attractive it's like you have the money yeah i call it the golden rule this is why when we became friends i was like i'm buying out your event and i'm sending my people there because i value what you teach so much i tell people the golden rule is when we were young the golden rule was treat other people as you would like to be treated right. basically right that's the golden rule right but when you become an adult, the golden rule is he who controls the gold makes the rules. Ooh, I like that. He who controls the gold makes the rules. I didn't say who has the gold. Right. I said he who controls the gold. And when you raise money, as you know very well, a lot of my students love learning from you and going to your events. And I love the way you teach too. It's very tactical rather than like, no offense to Ed Milet, but like Ed Milet has his place. But I always tell people like, once you listen to Ed Milet and you actually want to learn how to do it, then come see me. Because like Ed Milet's going to tell you like, get off your ass, stop being lazy. You're the one. Great. Now that you're motivated and you need to know how to actually do something. Right. Go to Amy Majori. She'll teach you how to raise private capital. So I tell my students, I'm like, go work with Amy Majori. She's gangster. But I, again, it's the golden rule. In fact, if I was going to rebrand your whole entire like raising capital thing, I would call it the golden rule or some event. I would call but it But I love rule. that though, because this is the only reason. So Cody was one of the guys who approached me a year ago and we were sitting in his office yeah. and he said, will you raise money for me? And I said, I don't understand. You're Cody Sperber. Like, why do you need or want me to raise money for you? Thank you. Yeah. And he's like, because I don't, I go, you can pick up the phone and have a million dollars right now. And he's like, but I don't want to do that. I don't have time for that. Exactly. I'm, he's busy finding the deal 
built, putting the team together, exactly. creating influence outward, right? All that kind of stuff. And he's got 85 other businesses he's running. So right. I wasn't in a position last year that I could have people raise money for me, but I am now. So like one thing that I did with my fund is I go, hey, guys, we need to make it available for people to do a fund of funds within our structure. And so I've got a handful of people. In fact, I was listening to a podcast the other day, this really big influencer has like 4 million subscribers and stuff. They were on a podcast and the person interviewing them says, hey, are you in real estate? And they go, yeah, I'm in real estate. I'm partnered with Pace Morby. Are they really partnered with me? Well, yeah, they, they are. It technically, Technically, yeah. yes. The way it's set up is that they're partnered with right. me. But what they're doing is they're really just going out and raising capital and they're bringing that capital to me. But that person being able to say that is huge. Huge. You know, and it's All like, the credibility. and technically they're being honest. Yeah, you they know? are being honest. It's a hundred percent. I just, the same thing I did for Vina Jetty. For right. I did two fund of funds with Vina and I said, this is my deal. I did two things. Okay. Brought the money to her. And then I, I'm a little bit crazy. You know what I did with my money that I made when I raised money for Vina Jetty, I really did it for the education and the credibility. And so when I raised the money, I raised a couple million dollars for Vina Jetty. I didn't have to find the deal, manage the deal, right. have the team. I still don't have to manage those assets. And I go, all right, well, I made, I think I made like 30, 40,000 bucks on raising that capital as a part of the fee structure that I had put together. You know what I did with that 40 grand? As I called every one of those people that were my investors and I said, I'm going to fly you first class and put you up in a hotel and we're going to go visit the property. And I spent all my money on that. Why? Because now I documented it and you saw it and everybody else saw it because now when I go raise my money again, now it compounds and the effect of me saying, hey, I'm raising money. So now when I go and do my own fund, which now I do, mm -hmm. and I go, hey, anybody want to invest with me? They're like, oh my gosh, I see how you treat your investors. Right. And it was all a very, a, a very structured way for me to go. One day I'll have my own fund. I'm going to leverage Vina and her deals and her education and her love and her support. And I'm going to support her. So that at some point I've compounded and I'm a great marketer. But here's the problem. People are so hung up on how they look and how they feel and how other people feel about them that they're like, I'm not one of them social media. Like even the people that are raising capital, you're like, you need to be on social media. Like, Ugh. Yeah, I know. I like people that teach social media, good luck. Cause you know what you're really struggling with is not the mechanics of how to do it. You're really struggling with people's mindset of fear about how people look and perceive of yeah. them. Yeah. No, First off, true. we all got broccoli in our teeth. We all don't look the way that you think we all should look. So just get over it. And people don't want to post. Right. And so like I could teach all these marketing strategies, but the reality is nobody ever executes on them. I used to struggle with that. I don't anymore, but I struggled with that too. Well, it's because you switched over to All Saints. So now you're feeling Brought confident. to you by All Saints. Brought to you by All Hey, All Saints. But guys, she is wearing nothing but All Saints today. Yeah. I would stand up and twirl. The problem is I could sit here all day long and I could just unload all these marketing I know, things on you. I know. And people are like, what are you doing? I, everything with me is I'm always doing four or five or six things all simultaneously, right? So like I even hired Chris, Chris Cinematic for everybody that wants to know. I hired Chris. This is how you met Chris, I believe. Right. Yeah. You introduced us. Yeah. So I hired Chris and gentleman on his team named Zach to travel from Louisiana through Texas and whatever. He, they're with me for 10 days. And I'm like, all right, I'm going to do all these things. And I, when people are like, oh, you're making YouTube content. No, I actually made like mini courses. I did all sorts of things through there that Zach and Chris might not, Chris probably knew what I was doing in, in some of those senses. Even the videographer has no idea what I'm doing. Yeah. I could just teach a whole class on how I market and how I do five, six, seven things at the same time. I'm not just making a YouTube video. One guy, I, I did a YouTube video the other day. I post it and it's like a behind the scenes vlog style. And like, 75th comment is like, this is just an ad. I was like, wow, finally somebody saw how I did this. <laughs> yeah, duh. And other people are like, how is this an ad? You just don't see how I'm doing what right. I'm doing. I don't think a lot of people do. No, if you're a great marketer, you yeah. do things very nuanced and right. very subtle. Actually, what is next for Pace Morby? That's an impossible question for me to answer <laughs> in like a short time frame. My fingers are in so many things. I have multiple partners. Every one of those partners has initiatives and companies that we're either buying, creating or whatever. Like that's with one partner. That one partner has three things going on that are pretty magnificent. Like if I told you, oh, yeah, I bought a CPA firm. Most people are like, oh my gosh, that's freaking legit. I, I have a lot going on. And so I just don't talk about it all because it alienates my audience. My audience says, they're like, oh my gosh, just listening to you talk. And if you watch my Instagram stories, I'll wear you out. In a good way. You're just like, holy In crap, my... how are you now here? And then here, and then here, and here, here, all within four days. This is insane. Well, no, I agree. My One of my most favorite videos of you on Instagram. <laughs> Is when you're like, I dated the life of an entrepreneur oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. and you lay down for half a second oh, and yeah, you yeah. stand back up. I was yeah. like, I don't know how you do it. Yeah. Uh, even chatting with you this morning, I'm like, dude, this is insane. That's insane. And what's funny is like you're here and in the calm of my house, but I have amazing partners. Like I texted Cody Barton this morning. I was like, hey, I just want to say thank you. I love you and appreciate you. 
I say that to my partners every week, Josiah, I send them a text message, Molly, same thing. And Ted, same thing, John, same thing. People that I have that are partners of mine, we balance each other out. Like I'm the crazy ultra driven and ultra ambitious. And I also come up with really great ideas. I come up with some bad ideas, that, but they stay in my brain. I let them, I figure out how to purge them, but the good ideas come out of my mouth. And when I have a good idea, I go, that's a great idea. I'm going to do it. I don't care who the partner is. I'm going to find them. <laughs> So I go find the partner that right. has the least going on and I go, Hey, I have this idea that benefits everybody, even if you're, you're not my partner on it. Kind of like I just launched a, a thing with Molly, a transaction coordination business, and it benefits my partner, Cody, who I do Gator stuff with. And it benefits my partner, Josiah, who I do sub two stuff with, because now we have transaction coordinators that can do all the transaction coordination yeah. properly. So it's like right. figuring out these little things that benefit everybody all day long. I'm just thinking about the, these ideas and I immediately go, okay, great idea but who's going to run it? Right. And then I pass it on to somebody else. Right. But it wasn't always like that. I had to go do the nitty gritty crap. I did go through what, you know, maybe what you've got to go through here in the future of like hiring and building a team that right. you go, I do want to continue to be lazy. I think that's a big brag. I think that's yeah, something that you, you should brag about. Yeah. I'm very proud of that. You should be. There's a guy, one of my students last night, Chef Joey out of Houston. He's in his car last night and he's asking me a question. He's like, hey, how do I balance it all? And da, 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 da. I'm like, why are you in your car at 11 o'clock at night? He's like, well, I'm just getting back from work. And I go, well, because you're a blue collar guy, you take pride in how hard you work, right? How many hours you put in, how how you grind. I go, that's not impressive. In fact, all it is, is it's a pr it's oppressive. Why? Because you walk into your house, you're begrudged, you're upset, you're frustrated, you're stressed out, whatever. You then transfer that energy onto your wife. Right. But there was a poll done recently by Forbes that talked about stay-at-home women and how they say the greatest luxury in their life that they aspire to is how can I be at home with my kids? It's the number one luxury a woman wants. But what a woman doesn't want, okay, look at you, how you spend your mornings. Yeah. You have the luxury of spending the morning with your daughter and being home with your daughter and being there and doing all those things. You have that luxury. You also balance work there, right? You sprinkle work in and you go, I'm going to do it in the laziest possible way, which is a, is a brag in my opinion. So I tell Chef Joe, I go, you know, what's not cool. The fact that your wife gets to stay home with the kids, but when you come home at 11 o'clock at night, you make her feel bad that you had to go out and work. Right. No woman wants the luxury of a watch. Like, let's say you buy your wife a beautiful Cartier watch, but every damn day you remind her how much it costs. Right. Nobody wants that. The actual brag is I have figured out how to balance my life in the way that I want to balance. And that's you. That's the ultimate brag. You know what? Thank you. And I agree. You know what my problem is? I feel like, because I am super type A and I am competitive, Yeah. but it's not about me like doing more than you or better than you. It's, I know that I'm capable of more. Yeah. And so I do love my life right now, but a part of me is like, Amy, if you just tried a little bit, like you could have such a greater impact. You know what I mean? Yeah, so, there, you know, I, I agree with that. I think that there's thousands of people that need what is in your brain. And also your teaching style is unique compared to mine, et cetera. Right. So it's like, there are a lot of people that because of your balance and because of this world that you've created for yourself, there are people that you have to say, I'm sorry, I'm not going to be able to impact your life. Right. And they're sitting on the sidelines. They don't know that you even exist. Think about this. There's a struggling mom. There's a struggling guy that's at his job that could easily quit his job within a year of knowing what you know. A hundred, six months. And he doesn't even know you exist right. because you're like, I'm chilling. But you have to figure out like, is that your calling on earth? Is your calling on earth to go and save every human being? Or is your calling to say, I'm going to make an impact, but really my focus is this, which is being a mom and a wife and a this and a homemaker and these types of things. And I'm going to bring in and sprinkle my goodness all over the world as much as I can within a very allotted time. That is your mixture. That's, That's what I, I know for sure. Like I told you earlier, I know for sure 50-50 balance my personal yeah. life with Sean and Emma with specifically not even my real estate portfolio, mm -hmm. just raising awareness on how to raise private money. Like yeah, I know yeah. those two just things for sure. That. And that's what's so crazy, you know, and you probably said this too, but I've heard a lot of people who run in our circle say, don't get shiny object syndrome, focus on one thing and one message. And that's what I started to do two years ago and things just started to come together. I love it. You know, so, I actually tell people don't focus on one thing. You should not marry the first person you date. That's a bad idea. Yeah, I would agree with that. Okay? Like yeah. you should go out and you, in fact, your future wife, for some of you single dudes out there, will be grateful for you to go out and screw up and make mistakes and get in fights with a girl because you're immature and then have that girl point out to you that you were a knucklehead and you did something wrong so that when you meet your future wife, you are trained a little bit better on how to treat a woman. Right. So I think that practice up front and a little bit of shiny object syndrome bouncing around and go, do I like single family? Do I like multifamily? Do I like single family Airbnb? Do I like single family pad split? Like, what is it that I want to do? You should have some shiny object syndrome for a year, maybe 18 months. And then at some point, you go, that's the thing I love. 
love. I know I love it because I tried these other five things and because of what's associated with them or the work that I have to do to put into them to make them successful, I know this is the thing. Yeah. And you did that with private raising private capital. You didn't just wake up one day and go, I'm going to raise private capital. No, I studied it for eight years. Yeah, and but then you I... had to figure out, is that something I'm passionate about? Right. And then you focused. Correct. Yes. And yeah, that took me eight years to figure out. Yeah. You've got experiences, resources, relationships, skills, et cetera, that you've accumulated over all these years. Not only did you research it for eight years, but then you found out like, wow, I actually have a knack for teaching this stuff. And I have a knack for teaching it so much that I'm passionate about it. And I'm passionate about it to the point where I'm not going to just teach textbook bullshit. I'm going to get people to actually do things tactically. Mm -hmm. So like, think about this. I go to a lot of three day events. You do too. You speak at them and it's like a bunch of just information <sighs> overload. I'm like, guys, if you're going to do information, give it to them on day one. And then on day two or day three or whatever, you should have some tactical stuff. It's right. like one of the things I know you do two different types of events. One of my favorite things that you do is your, what do you call them? Boot camps? What do you call them? I have a one day workshop and then a two day conference. Okay. So the workshop is gangster. I love that. And Thank I also you. love that. Yeah. It's so good. Because I get to see people get, ta they tag me on it, right? Because we're friends. People right. tag me like, oh, I'm with Amy Majori. We're actually raising money live. Right. It's like, dude, so many people go and they get educated and educated and educated on YouTube and they read a book and they do whatever and they do nothing with it. And it's because you need a human being. It's like when I learned how to frame a house, you can't learn this shit on YouTube. You can be inspired by it right. on YouTube, but at some point, another human being has to go, let me show you how to do it. In fact, let me hold you accountable live right, right now. We're doing it. So I love the way you teach. I love the way that you're actually getting people to walk out of that room with their lives changed and you're being unapologetic in the way that you hold them accountable. Right. It's really awesome. And then you have a two-day event, which I haven't been to your two-day events. What's the format of those? So my two-day conference, it's similar to a one-day workshop, but with different tactical mm -hmm. implementation strategies. So on day one, everyone comes in and these are larger events. So the workshops are 14 people. The two-day conference is 200 people. Mm -hmm. So they all come in and on day one. Why not 15 people? Like what's up with 14? It's just the did, max Chris, capacity. Did you think that too? Or you're like, wow, that's random. <laughs> it's the max capacity of a hotel boardroom. Oh, is it? 14? <laughs> yeah. okay, like I've cool. even had them like bring in chairs and line them up okay, against the wall. All right, all right. So, so guys, the answer has been given. There you go. <laughs> but what's cool about the two-day conference is day one is also implementation, mm -hmm. just different strategies. Yeah. And then day two, I bring in all the expert investor guest speakers who will when, talk when to you. When are you doing another one of these? The next two-day conference is in Austin, Texas, Dope. November 4th and 5th. Okay, Austin, Texas, November 4th and 5th. And where can my people get their tickets? Where can I get my ticket? The link in my bio on Instagram. What if I don't have Instagram? Raisingpm.com. Raisingpm.com. Raisingprivatemoney.com. Forward slash. Forward slash. Live okay. events. Gonna if I walk over. away from that event, what will I be able to tell my spouse? I spent money on this event. I came home and I, I have this. Number one, it's the network. So yeah. I purposely. Well, can I find this network somewhere else? No, you can't. Why? Because I'm really good at drawing in a crowd of people who genuinely care about one another so and helping a filtering mechanism. Yeah. Right? So you filter people in that are also like minded, like these people that also are trying to accomplish the same goals. Therefore, they can help accomplish each other's goals. Together. Correct. Like they leave with friendships, business relationships. That's that number meaningful, one. Right? Meaningful. Not yes. Like if I were, if I, I made a new friendship the other day at the QT gas station with the guy <sighs> who's the clerk. Great. But like, how's he going to help me make money? So you're telling, saying I'm going to find relationships with people that are going to make money Correct. with me. And then the second thing is I'm going to be armed with more skills and resources to go and leverage into other relationships to provide value to other people. Yes. And they are actually going to have raised money live and in person at my, like real private money without targeting their friends and family members. Oh, really? Yes. Okay. Sold. You got me sold. So that's what I do differently. I'm not going to say, go ask your friends and family. Here's that. how you go build rapport with your Uber driver, people at airports, airplanes, hotels, gas stations. Yeah. Love so thank you. You got me sold. Go to her link in her bio. They'll put up on the screen, whatever it is, whatever domain they end up choosing, but go to the event. I want to go to the, one of these events. I might go to November 4th. That would 5th. be amazing. Chris will be there. Do you know Andrew Schultz? He's yeah, going to be Andrew. there. He does my hey, ads. Wait, Andrew Schultz, the comedian? Oh, no. Ads guy. Oh, okay. I don't well, even I, know an Andrew Schultz You don't comedian. know? And Sean would know. I don't know. Oh, he's phenomenal. What's fun? We got Rob speaking, Rob Abasolo, Vina, love Zasha, love them. Mark Kohler, who yep. you have to meet. I like Mark. If you haven't met him yet. I have not met him in person. I just know his content. Very passionate. Yes, guys, make sure you guys tune in to the, that event. If you don't, the thing is your events sell out. So like, don't be a freaking knucklehead. Just go to the event. Will I be able to have a chance to meet you? Maybe give you a hug? Yes. Smell, everyone. smell you. <laughs> Everyone's there, like talking, speakers as well. Like you're for not the just entire hanging weekend. out in the green room. No. And you know what, actually, some of my coaches have actually said that you're too, um, what's the word? 
available. You're too available. Yeah. And I'm like, Tell but those that's... coaches they can kiss my I will meet every single Agreed. person. Like that's who I am. I'm not trying to be a person of influence. I'm trying to be a person of impact. Yeah. And you want to go hang out in the green room? That's a person of influence. I want to be a person in the hallway that creates impact. And that's that's why I vibe with you. Yeah, thank you. But that's how I was like, no, this is who I am. This is who I am. Guys, if the event sells out, I will tell Amy that I'll be there hanging out in the hallway. Maybe <laughs> one of you guys can smell me too. <laughs> okay. Um, this has been great. Thank you so yeah. much. So if I'm starting in real estate, why is it vital for me to learn how to raise private capital? Can I do real estate without private money? Sure. And it just depends on what your goals are. If you want to treat real estate as a side hustle and a hobby and only invest in one or two deals a year, there's no problem using your own money. It's not even my opinion. It's a fact. The only way to grow and scale your real estate business is by leveraging other people's money. So one of the things that I decided to do 10 years ago when I got into real estate investing was using my own money to build up my passive income and then using other people's money as my active income, right? So if I'm doing a fix and flip or a new build or even like any transactional funding on a wholesale deal, I'll leverage other people's money, hopefully turn a profit, we'll make some money and lose money, right? But now I make an infinite return. Why does a private money lender want to give me money? Like why would they want, why wouldn't they just wanted to go do these deals on their own? If there's anything that I could say to anyone, there are so many benefits to being a private money lender. Three words that come to mind, protect, secure, and insure. When you're a private money lender, you get the protection in the form of a promissory note. When you are a private money lender, you get security. Your name is attached to the mortgage. Number three is as a private money lender, you're insured. You are listed as a beneficiary or lost PE on the investor's builder's risk insurance policy. They don't get that in the bank. They don't get that in the stock market. They don't get that in currency. So those three things alone, aside from earning double digit returns and their short-term notes and you're building long-term relationships and you're building your passive income, there's so many other amazing benefits, but the protection, security, and insurance is huge. Okay, so you, do you teach people how to find private money lenders and investors? I do. So yeah, it was actually at the height of COVID. Um, I started a mentorship program called RPM, Raising Private Money. And it was something that I never really even thought about. For the first eight years of my career, investors all over the country started asking me for help. And they were like, Amy, you make it look so easy to raise capital. I didn't know. I just had a natural skill set. I was good at raising money from day one. So finally at the height of COVID, when the entire world shut down and I was at home and I wasn't traveling, I was like, you know what? I'm bored. People keep asking me for help. Yeah, why not create like a little small mentorship program and just teach people all over the country how to raise private money? And so that's what I did. But what's so crazy is I was just so focused on systematizing and strategizing and teaching people how to raise money in a non-overwhelming way. Mm. It's global. Like we have people in Japan, Mexico, Puerto Rico, England. I'm forgetting a bunch of other countries, which I would never have imagined. And it's- So it's probably pretty easy to say that this RPM community means something to you. Yeah. Uh, that makes me want to cry. God. I'm not going to cry. Oh my God, why are you making me cry? Because that's my job. <sighs> but everyone knows I wear my heart on my sleeve. Very vulnerable. Yeah, like this is my number one, you know? And it's like you and I talk, you know, often about like, I was just telling you this morning, like my fear, like one of my fears is growing this community because it's such an amazing tight knit community of 350 investors all over the world. And we really love each other. Like I know everyone, we go on vacations together. We go to events together. We do deals together. We raise money for one another. And my biggest fear is, you know, I feel like everyone needs to know how to raise private money and I want to have such a big impact, but I'm scared that like people are going to come into the community with the wrong intentions. They will. I want to grow and raise awareness because everyone needs to know it, but then I don't because I don't want like to come into our community. Well, you've got, you know, you've got this amazing moment, right? Where I was three years ago with my community that I, when I had three, 400 people where you now have to start taking 10, 15 of these people and say, I need you to help me grow this from a leadership standpoint. So that as you scale, you have people that are kind of watchers. They're watching how the community is operating and you're not going to be able to see how a thousand people are active in your future Facebook group. So you need other people that are leaders. And I call mine regional leaders. So I actually identify them across the country and I go, you're in charge of California because that's a whole region. You're in charge of North Cal Carolina, North Carolina, South Carolina, blah, 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 blah. I have like 75 regional leaders. You should also start investing in those leaders from a standpoint of like, I want to grow this. I want more people to come in. That will benefit you because more people will be able to raise capital for your deals right. and create it. So there's alignment there that they're like, I want this community to grow too. And I get benefit from Amy's community growing. I just brought on like team leads to help me with our live calls. Mm -hmm. 
But you're talking about salespeople. No, like students in my community okay, who've had success. Yeah, That's so they'll help me like leaders. lead live calls. But now it's like, even you say that, I'm like, how in the world am I supposed to manage? I mean, and they love doing it, right? But it's like, I don't even know. I was talking to Vina Jetty about this. And one thing that I've tried to do is that 13 of my top executives in my companies are all women. And I really try and invest in women. I have eight sisters. And so I see how I feel that the industries that I go into are lacking female presence. Do you feel like being a female puts you at a disadvantage of being in this industry? No, I actually think it puts me at an advantage because a lot of people, whether we like it or not, there will be people out there who are skeptical of a female in a male dominated role. And it's interesting because they'll talk to you initially in a demeaning way. But once they hear you speak, like when somebody hears me speak and I know their intentions are not genuine, immediately they're like, wow, like this girl knows what she's talking about. And that confidence just comes from my knowledge and education, right? And and also too, like as women, we're more approachable. We're easier to talk to. There are so many ways that as a real estate investor, not just in raising private money, that we have massive advantages in this industry, but also being able to balance like your ethics and your morale, right? Because it can go both ways. And Jamil and I talked a little bit about this yesterday. So I think it only helps us being a female in this industry. Love it. Thank you.